Ever since man first flew, he has been driven to build faster and faster airplanes. The SR-71 Blackbird flies at three times the speed of sound, faster than a rifle bullet, another milestone in the quest for speed. Speed has always held a fascination for man. The desire to beat the latest record has led to all kinds of technical progress, especially in aviation. Contact. 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 In 1909, this Curtis Pusher was the fastest airplane in the world. Glenn Curtis had built and raced motorcycles in his craving for speed. He built the 60 horsepower pusher to compete in the Gordon Bennett Trophy Race at the world's first air show at Reims in France in 1909. Curtis was the only American there and he started as the underdog arriving just in time to take part. The Gordon Bennett Trophy was by far the most coveted prize of the meet. Francis Louis Blériot was the favorite in his monoplane, fresh from his triumphant crossing of the English Channel. The spectators were treated to a thrilling race. The result was in the balance right up to the closing stages. Curtis beat Blériot by six seconds, setting the first speed record for airplanes at 46 and a half miles an hour. Dale Kreitz was four at the time, and at 83, still flies his Curtis Pusher in the skies over Wisconsin. You had all the apprehensions of what can happen, of course, when you're up there, whether this engine will keep on going, it could stop firing any time, and then you are looking for a place to land. You work more flying a Curtis Pusher in the 10 minutes than you flying all day in a normal airplane, because the airplane has no stability whatsoever because the air currents are rising faster than the airplane moves forward. They always said they flew the darn things when the dew was on the grass in the morning and the mosquitoes were out at night. So that eliminated these thermals that give you a, a bump. All of a sudden you feel like you're in an elevator. You're just sitting there floating along in the air with nothing under you and you uh, just feel like you're accomplishing something out of this world. It's what Curtis said at one time, I'd fly for the mere sport of it if I wasn't in the business because there's a fascination about flying that's difficult to explain and hard to resist. And that's just about what flying is. The air meet at Reims created enormous interest in aviation. Air racing was clearly a moneymaker. Cities across Europe and America put up ever bigger prizes to attract the aviators. The top competitive pilots, like Louis Pollum and Jean Cano of France, and Claude Graham White from England, became stars and earned fortunes. Admirers turned up at races to catch a glimpse of them. Death only added more.
more drama to the occasions. On the first Circuit of Europe race, three pilots died in one day. A French cabinet minister was accidentally killed when the crowd pushed him in front of a propeller. But closeness to danger only drew bigger crowds and attracted more pilots with the will to win. The speed of aircraft moved steadily upward. To make them faster, designers improved their machines. The maze of struts and wire of the pusher biplanes gave way to the sleeker monoplane. By 1911, Edward Newport had raised the record to over 80 miles an hour in a monoplane. By 1913, it had reached 126 miles an hour. <laughs> France was the most advanced nation in aviation. They took pride in the achievements of their pilots. At the heart of that success was a revolutionary new engine. Many early aircraft had water-cooled engines, which were heavy and tended to overheat. French engineers hit on the idea of making the engine spin with the propeller, cooling itself in the process and also reducing weight. The result was the rotary engine, which powered most record-breaking aircraft of the day and many others like the British Avro 504. Air racing had shown its value as a proving ground, and when Europe turned to war in 1914, rotary engines based on the French design powered a generation of fighters like the Sopwith Pup. On the racing circuit, one event more than any other came to symbolize the quest for speed. It started at Monaco in 1913. Jacques Schneider, the French Undersecretary for Air, wanted to promote the design of seaplanes. He donated a magnificent trophy for which international teams would compete. After the war, the Schneider Cup became the most coveted prize in aviation. Italy won it in 1920 and 21, and Britain in 1922. Then the Americans sent a team of Navy pilots who swept the board the winner reaching 181 miles an hour. The secret lay in their new Curtis D-12 engines, which could be cooled by water even at very high power. In 1925, an American Army pilot, James Doolittle, won the trophy. Then the United States government withdrew financial support, leaving the Schneider Cup to the Europeans. The 1927 race was held in Venice between the Italians and British. Both teams had new aircraft. The Italian M-52s gradually dropped out with engine problems, leaving two S-5s to romp home. Flight Lieutenant Webster won at 281 miles an hour. Britain won the 1929 race, and in 1931, John Boothman ended the saga of the Schneider Cup by winning it outright. Hooray! Then George Stainforth broke the world speed record at 407 miles an hour. With the end of the Schneider Cup, much of the competitiveness went out of air racing in Europe. But in America, the combination of high speeds and low flying was turned into a spectator sport, a national air races. They were a potent mixture of spectacle and danger for the crowd, and cash, glamour, and glittering prizes for the pilots. Today, the races are held at Reno, Nevada. Many of the aircraft are fighters dating from the Second World War, and racing them is expensive and a labor of love for the pilots. But winning remains the objective, and the setting is openly gladiatorial. 
While the crowds wait for the racing to start, the organizers entertain them with stunt flying and razzmatazz. barely changed in half a century. However daring the barnstormers, the main attraction was always the mass takeoff for closed circuit races like the Thompson Trophy. The pilots were dedicated to the quest for speed, but they were a different breed from the military men of the Schneider Cup. They were self-sufficient types, adventurers, garage mechanics, and showmen operating on a shoestring, and one of them, Benny Howard, built his first aircraft to carry bootleg whiskey. And racing was not confined to men. Congratulations, sweetheart. You set, set a new world record. Well, thank you. I see you get to be down on the ground again. Well, how did it go, anyway? Mary well, Hazlett was one of the top the racing pilots of her day. I'm very glad to have been able to increase the women's speed record in my Widow Williams racer from 210 miles an hour to a little over 255. And I hope that I'll live a long time to go farther and faster. For women, there were the powder puff races. Well, I think the powder puff derby was a misnomer. It was certainly nothing powder puff about it. As a matter of fact, the girl was killed in the first one. We were a different breed. I won't say we were a better breed, but we were different. I suppose it required a certain amount of perhaps foolhardiness disregard of one's own skin. I wouldn't call it courage. This was just something that I always wanted to do. I loved it. And um, I suppose I would be flying now, except there are very little demands for the services of an elderly lady test pilot. remains the hallmark of a racing aircraft. This is like the world's greatest flying museum. You know, you go to a wonderful museum and it's like having stuffed dogs. I mean, they don't bark, they don't eat. But when you come out here, you know, these Hummers work. And they're going to work like you'll never see them work anywhere else. grab a hold of an airplane here and literally take your life in both hands. One for the throttle and one for the stick, and you can control your own destiny free of most rules and regulations. Well, it may not be better than your wedding night, but it's probably better than the second one. You know, adrenaline is a naturally induced narcotic, but it's stronger than most narcotics. And once you get it moving around in there, I mean, it's a rush that's hard to describe. And you get it when you get this puppy moving. used to be packed. It was standing room only. But I think it was partly the same motivation that the Roman crowds had to come and see the Christians torn up by the lions. Partly 
a macabre feeling that if they stayed long enough, there was going to be a disaster. And there always was. The cost in lives was high, but there were always new pilots waiting to race. To stay competitive, safety was often compromised for speed. The tiny GB racer was nearly all engine and it was very difficult to handle. One pilot who flew it was the Schneider winner, Jimmy Doolittle. If you take an airplane up in the air and just set everything just right, the airplane will fly itself. The unique thing about the GB is that if you took it up in the air, no matter what you did, if you let go of it, it took over. And apparently in an effort to destroy itself, you would it. But the GB was fast. In 1931, Lowell Bales, a racing pilot, took one to challenge the speed record for land planes held by the French at 278 miles an hour. On his first attempt, he reached 281 miles an hour, but was denied the official record because the margin was not large enough. So he went out again. This time he reached 300 miles an hour. Bales was killed instantly. The following year, Jimmy Doolittle did break the record in a GB. He retired from racing shortly afterwards. Only three were ever built, and both the others crashed, killing their pilots. Aviation wouldn't be where it is today if it hadn't been for the early flying. Racing advanced the design of the airplanes. The owners were constantly trying to make them safer, make them faster, perhaps make them faster rather than safer. I think their place in history is well earned. In the Battle of Britain in 1940, Hitler received his first real setback at the hands of the Royal Air Force. Victory was based on two British fighters, the Hurricane and the Spitfire. Of the two, the Spitfire was the faster. The Spitfire was the direct descendant of the last Schneider Cup winners. Designed by the same man, R.J. Mitchell, its Merlin engine was derived from the racing engines built by Rolls-Royce over a decade earlier. Flying the Spitfire was a joy for its test pilots. I would describe the Spitfire as certainly as what you might call a sports aeroplane. It was tremendously exciting. I mean, I was only 24 at the time, and so I thought, well, you know, that, that, that's exactly the sort of airplane everybody wanted to fly. And it was a pilot's airplane. I mean, all the subsequent pilots were afraid they all loved it. The prototype Spitfire had a fixed pitch, twin bladed propeller, a very coarse pitch. So takeoff was very sluggish. So it wasn't anything like the sort of brisk takeoff that we had eventually when we had constant speed propellers. Nearly all previous fighters in the Air Force had been air cooled and they therefore had rather large, bulbous engines. The Spitfire, with, with its 12-cylinder in-line engine, it had a beautiful, long, sort of sleek nose, and as an airplane, it had the look of a, a thoroughbred about it. Germany had comparable piston engine fighters, but the Luftwaffe was experimenting with new forms of propulsion. The Messerschmitt 163 had revolutionary features, rocket power, 
swept back wings, and no tail. A new shape designed purely for speed. There was no room in the wings for a retractable undercarriage, so the wheels were designed to fall away after takeoff. Its fuel was a volatile cocktail of hydrogen peroxide, hydrazine hydrate, methyl alcohol, and water. Pilots had to be protected against the fuel which would dissolve them. The aircraft was tricky to handle and new pilots had yet another problem. There were no two-seat training versions, so their first flight had to be made alone. The rocket plane was so secret that seeing it for the first time came as quite a shock to its pilots. After I had been taken into the hangar and had seen the bird, I was very excited. It was simply a winged plane driven by a rocket. The exhaust was roughly a little longer than a sewing machine. Two men could lift the motor in and out, but the power was enormous. The thrust of the rocket motor was approximately 1,700 kilos. That was around 6,000 horsepower, a power not available to fighter aircraft up until that time. Test pilots like Hannah Reich learned to love the plane. And I can only tell you it was fascinating. It was like thundering through the skies sitting on a cannon ball, like being intoxicated by speed. It was only an overwhelming impression. At the end of the air boundary, you already reached about 500 miles per hour, and with constant speed, you were climbing up in one and a half to two minutes into a height of 30,000 feet. concept was quite unique. 163 was an electrifying aircraft because it had this startling rate of climb. Normal fighters had a rate of climb for about 3,000 feet a minute. The 163 was climbing at 14,000 feet a minute initially. But of course, on the other side of the balance was the fact that it had very limited endurance. And indeed, at the throttle was held at full power from the rocket, it only had three minutes. In the closing stages of the war, the Messerschmitt 163 was used to intercept Allied bombers. Its scoring rate was disappointing, but it startled Allied crews. Two of them hit us. Actually, they appeared like a, a bat with the, the white exhaust coming out. And all of a sudden, they turned and they came down vertically. And I realized that that was something different. And for, for a moment, I was wondering, is this the... The secret weapon that Hitler's always saying he's going to hit us with, they just amazed us because they could outmaneuver and outrun any airplane that we had at the time. Pilots had to make their final approach without engine power. Their landing was done on a skid. It was dangerous to land any fuel aboard, and they had a lot of accidents. In fact, 80% of their losses were on takeoff or landing. On one occasion, Hannah Reich had to land with the wheels still attached. I had to come to approach the airfield in a greater height as normally, but this destroyed the whole airflow because it was only wing without tail plane. It came out of control and crashed in the field. It was completely demolished and my head uh, came to an instrument and I suffered. Uh, my nose was, I have an artificial nose and it's quadruple of 
fractured head and, and vertebra broken and many things. So after having been five months hospitalized, I was well again, spurred on by the only burning wish to continue as test pilot again. Test flying was often just as hazardous with another new propulsion system, the jet engine. The jet was to open up a new era in the quest for speed. Germany was the first country to have jet-powered aircraft flying. But the creator of the jet engine was a young Royal Air Force officer, Frank Whittle. He patented the engine in 1930, but the British Air Ministry was slow to see the possibilities. He was kept starved of resources, and progress was painfully slow. His counterpart in Germany freely acknowledges Whittle's lead. If the Air Ministry would not have denied support to Sir Frank, he could have brought to work a jet engine at least four years earlier, that would have been a deterrent for Hitler to go into Poland and risk a war with England and France. Hans von Ohain worked for Heinkel. By 1941, they were building a prototype fighter, the 280. Messerschmitt was building another. The German Air Ministry was more supportive of new ideas than its British counterpart, but there was skepticism about jet propulsion in Germany, too. Even the commander of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Goering, was slow to appreciate its value. They thought, these are Heinkel's play toys, which have no future. Also, the imagination of the war would be very short, and in that time, it would be won by normal piston engines. The Heinkel was ready first and flying at over 500 miles an hour. But it was the rival Messerschmitt, the 262 with its longer endurance, which went into mass production as a fighter. Pilots finally got their hands on it in late 1944. For me, it was all sunshine. I felt like an emperor. When I was in a 109 together with 10 mosquitoes, then I had no chance. But with the 262, I was laughing. I took off, left the mosquitoes and the Mustang standing. Naturally, the disadvantages showed up on operations. It was difficult for us to find a good position from which to shoot at the opponent, because the difference in speed could not be reduced. And so it often happened that we flew right past opponents without having a chance to shoot at them, simply because we were too fast. Without any question, the ME-262 was the most formidable aircraft of World War II. Really, it looked rather like a shark. It looked ferocious and yet exciting. Once it was airborne, it was in a class of its own. Group Captain Eric Brown flew captured 262s after the war. Their jet engines had, to the best of our knowledge, a scrap life of 25 hours because at that stage of development, of course, the German engines were very shaky. And, of course, without documentation, there was always that slightly nervous feeling that you were perhaps flying a jet engine with 24 hours and 50 minutes on it. But the Germans, having lost command of the skies, took a more realistic view. Why should the engine live forever? when the pilot would be killed with the airplane in combat much sooner. At over 600 miles an hour, Messerschmitt's rocket-powered 163 and jet-powered 262 were the fastest aircraft of the war. Oh. 
In Britain, war had jolted the air ministry into action. The first flight of a British jet came in 1941, the experimental E-2839. By the summer of 1944, the first Gloucester Meteor jet fighters were in squadron service. After the war, a new fight began. We suddenly found ourselves competitive with our allies because the enemy had evaporated. And it became a race, quite frankly, between the Americans and ourselves to be the first to break the sound barrier, which was the big goal in those days. The British government now put its faith in a new high-speed research aircraft from the de Havilland Company, the DH-108, the Swallow. Its tailless, swept-wing design owed a lot to captured German aircraft. Its purpose was to explore flying at close to the speed of sound, where pilots fought for control against buffeting and turbulence. On a test flight over the Thames estuary, the DH-108 broke up in midair, killing Geoffrey de Havilland's eldest son. Meanwhile, America was ready with a radically new research aircraft. The Bell X-1 was rocket-powered, and its design was based on the shape of a heavy-caliber bullet. The pilot was Captain Charles Chuck Yeager. And I remember Colonel Boyd, our boss at flight test, coming out here to Miroc and saying, hey, we're not going to hurt anybody. And he cited as an example of the DH-108 uh, killing a couple of pilots. And so the, the British stopped all research and development in the High Mock region. And it hurt them badly even today. And consequently, he didn't want the US Air Force to get into that position. Rocket fuel only lasted a short time, so the X-1 was carried aloft in the bomb bay of a B-29. No airplane had ever flown much above 90% of the speed of sound until we got the X-1 up there. And consequently, every flight that we made, we were in a, a region where no one had ever had an airplane before. Basically, flight testing in the old days, we didn't have wind tunnel data. We didn't have uh, simulators or computer technology. Today, you have all three, so consequently, you can let the test pilot fly the simulator. So when he flies a new airplane, he's an old hand in the airplane. In the old days, it was trial and error. On the 14th of October, 1947, Chuck Yeager flew faster than south. We realized, even when we started with the X-1, that the so-called sound barrier really restricted us from going any faster. And once we got the X-1 above the speed of sound, then, hey, this opens up the whole universe for us. A year later in Britain, John Derry took a DH-108 through the sound barrier. Speed still attracted the crowd. The Farnborough Air Show of 1952 was packed to watch Derry fly supersonically in a new de Havilland fighter, the DH-110. He took off, and we knew he was going to break the sound barrier. And he went up into the sky very high. It disappeared, and then it came back as a very, very small dot, which got larger. And then suddenly, there were three. And this part of the engine, I believe it was, suddenly veered to its right and went into the hillside where we had been standing. There was this awful silence. And then there's noise, screams, cries, ambulances, the lot. Almost immediately afterwards, Neville Duke went up in a plane and broke the sound barrier. That, to me, was a very, very brave thing to do. 
an amazing man, a unique man, but then they all are. The Farnborough tragedy forced Britain to take stock of its high-speed research program. Reaching for the skies, a TNT original will return in a moment. The unique story of our conquest of the air continues. It did seem almost too big to fly. Part three salutes the giants crowding the sky above. I put the sweat of my life into this thing. And the bombers pulverizing the world below. Witness it all only on TNT when Robert Vaughn hosts part three of the four-part saga... America, with its huge resources and determination to succeed, was helped by experience and knowledge gain from the British and the Germans. The Americans built and launched the first fighter to operate at the speed of sound, the F-86 Sabre. The Sabre had a movable tailplane, a feature which came directly from the X-1 research program. The flying tail, as it was known, was a closely guarded secret which put America well ahead of its rivals. It was amusing to me, you know, it took the British and the French and the Soviet Union almost five years to find that little trick out with the flying tail. But we put it on the F-86, and that was a big thing that came out of it. In the Korean War, that extra control at very high speeds gave American fighter pilots an added advantage over their opponents in Russian-built MiG-15s. The quest for speed was now centered in America, where the X-1 was just the first in a line of experimental aircraft known as the X-Series. Chuck Yeager flew at two and a half times the speed of sound in 1953. In 1956, Mel App died after touching Mach 3 in the swept wing X-2. By 1960, the X-15 was flying even faster and ultimately it reached nearly seven times the speed of sound. We would be nowhere in aeronautics and space if we hadn't had the X program. And we could see and vision that we were going to continue with research airplanes and that all the way to orbit and space, which was our goal. The quest for speed was still an exciting human adventure, but it was, too, a highly complex one. It was a development of uh, afterburner engines, different configured airplanes, swept wings, delta wings, thin wings, thick wings, and primarily into stability and control, ejection seats, pressure suits, see all of the things that's associated with airplanes and speed. Uh, we were working on in the late 40s, early 50s, and we worked on parachutes, spent a lot of time in centrifuges, working on G-suits, worked on helmets, oxygen masks, and everything that goes along with airplanes. It was a wonderful error because we tried out so many different kinds of airplanes and so many different propulsion systems and the rewards were very great. Turning these rewards into practical aircraft was up to designers like Lockheed's Ben Rich. The biggest problem with the X programs is they were transient programs. The X airplanes, you know, they went Mach 3 for six seconds. Whereas we had to develop airplanes that you have to fly not for just seconds, but for minutes and maybe hours at supersonic speeds. The impetus behind the X program was to build ever faster fighters, to give pilots an edge over the enemy. The first to operate at twice the speed of sound was the Lockheed Starfighter. Even now, the top fighting speed of aircraft is not much higher. And their job is still the same as the Sopwith, the Spitfire, the Messerschmitt 262, and the Sabre, to use speed to intercept the enemy. There is only one operational aircraft which can sustain speeds of over three times the speed of sound. The United States Strategic Reconnaissance Aircraft, the SR-71, the Blackbird. 
The SR-71, with its ominous beauty, is one of the world's classic aircraft. Packed with sophisticated surveillance equipment, the power of its two engines is more than that of a great ocean liner. The airplane is basically 90% titanium inside now. They found out early on if you use cadmium and scratch it or strike it against titanium, over a long period of time, the airplane will eventually corrode and get stress fractures right where that scratch was. So every tool that the man uses out here on this airplane is cadmium free because of that. Very unique airplane. The skin of the airplane in places is actually the outside of the fuel tank. So once you get this tremendous heating, therefore expansion, contraction when it comes down and cools, it causes a little bit of wear and tear on uh, any place there might be a rivet. We haven't developed a way to stop that fuel leakage over the years, and we don't really get too concerned about it because the fuel's not very volatile. If you threw a match into a puddle of the fuel, the match would go out. They say if you threw a bucket on a roaring campfire, it'd probably put the campfire out. Now, I don't want to try that, but that's what they say. For the men who take the Blackbird for a nine-hour flight to the edge of space, the long preparations are amongst the most meticulous required of any flyers anywhere in the world. These crew members are under the same stresses that astronauts are under. We are at altitudes above 50,000 feet up in the high altitude range near space. In fact, this suit has a pressure differential great enough to go all the way to the moon if necessary. Pressure suit provides you your own uh, protection. It's like your own little mini environment. You've got your controllers to maintain your temperature. If you're on a long mission and the, the helmet is extremely heavy right on your shoulders at the base of your neck, if that becomes too heavy, you can actually increase the pressure of your suit. And the suit will inflate and take all the weight off your shoulders or wherever. The pressurized leak tank. Take a breath and hold, please. Go ahead and breathe. Going up, system two. These people are not superhumans. In fact, even a few of the crew members you'll see sneaking a little pink rabbit or something into their suit is a good luck charm. They're still human. Uh, they just do a job and they do it well, and uh, they're very professional at it. In the cockpit, we take aboard uh, tube food. It comes in a giant sized toothpaste tube, and then you can get everything from butterscotch pudding to beef and gravy to you name it. There's about a selection of 10, 15 items. The food basically tastes like baby food, except for the puddings tastes like puddings, but when you get into the beef and gravies, it's just a bunch of mush, but very tasty, actually. There are airplanes that can go 80,000 plus feet. There are airplanes that can fly about as fast as we do, but the big difference between us and them is that we get up there, we go that fast, we go that high, and we stay there. There are those days when you get up, birds are singing, the sun is shining, your breakfast was cooked just the way you like it, everything's on time, and then, after all our pre-flight ground checks, after that three hours, we're finally ready to push the power up and break ground. same time 
you can feel the acceleration and you just point the nose at the sky and go. There's nothing, nothing in the world to compare to that feeling. Physically, you can't really tell how fast you're going. Uh, you don't have anything to compare it to. There aren't any clouds whizzing by or you don't see the road going by you that close. It's mind boggling, actually. You're traveling through the air, literally, faster than a speeding bullet. You're covering a mile every two seconds. For a quarter of a century, the Blackbird has been regularly flying faster than any other aircraft in the world. What more can aviation achieve in its unrelenting quest for speed? We can go as far as man's imagination. We have the capabilities today that if you can think about it, we can do it. We have the materials, the know-how. We have the capabilities today to fly Mach 6, to fly Mach 11. The question is, can we afford it and do we need it? If you have answers to both those questions, I say, yes, we can do it. <laughs> 